the push and pull factors that conceptualization comes from a very old school or traditional theory of migration studies and it's based on Ravenstein's laws of migration and essentially it looks at um, the decision making factors or what goes into migrants decision making um, from an economic standpoint so it's largely an individualized understanding of why migrants move and uh, migration studies has um, moved past this um, so it's not to say that the push and pull um, understanding is irrelevant but we now know that migration is much more complex um, a much more complex phenomenon that is in, informed by the decision making of multiple individuals, sometimes households, and that it goes beyond the economic and includes social factors. So in the Caribbean, we refer to a, a culture of migration. This is something that's been around since the, about the 70s or 80s in the literature. And so in our culture of migration, when we refer to persons moving, we don't just include people who leave for economic reasons, which is the emphasis of the push and pull theory. But we would also look at um, mothers who leave children behind, students who go abroad to study, um, seasonal workers, um, so domestics and farm workers. Um, these are just examples. And then even people who leave just to have a different way of life. So um, yes, it's an, an older and foundational theory and you will find in popular parlance that people still use those. And some migration scholars still use that where that's the emphasis of the research. But because migration is much more complex than that we have other theories that have evolved to account for the way that people move. And Caribbean migration scholarship draws on those grander theories. One of the Caribbean theories that has emerged is this concept of viral children. Um, that's by um, Dr. Crawford Brown. So that's one of the, the theories that has emerged in our own intellectual space to explain um, the impact of largely women, but the impact of families um, migrating. It is, um, it's more the, the term and the coining of the term because we know from our literature um, and other and oral history that persons have always received packages. It used to be parcels in the post. Um, when persons started migrating more in the 70s and 80s, then it became viral. So it's not new to receive things from persons who've gone abroad. But what is new is how the absence of the mother um, has influenced the lives of the children and how children respond to um, receiving the package and being cared for in absentia by an extended family member that is new for her work. I'll just say um, before we, we talk about the contemporary issues that there, in my estimation, maybe others would, would disagree, There's, there seemed to be a lull in scholarship on migration. So after about the 90s, um, things tapered off a bit. So it's not that scholarship wasn't happening, but the, the volume of scholarship was much less than what would have um, been happening in the 70s and 80s. I've been trying to explain or, or understand why this is the case. It could have to do with funding, it could just be with researchers' personal interests. Um, so it's what's happening now, hopefully, with migration cluster is to highlight the scholarship that is taking place, especially that which focuses on the contemporary. So um, there's several emerging themes. I'll highlight three. 
One is related to the exhibition, which had focused on the experience of the Windrush generation. So um, you may be aware of the hostile environment policy in the UK, which resulted in the deportation of several Caribbean descended, um, really Commonwealth, but affected mostly Caribbean descended migrants. And um, one of the consequences of this policy is the deportation of persons who went to the UK as children, committed criminal offenses, and um, were subsequently deported. So we have um, mostly re media related research on the experience of the Windrush generation and their descendants, but there's also academic research on this um, deportation policy. So there was a recent book by a PhD student from the University of Oxford, who I think is now based at Manchester. And he talks about this deportation policy and the institutional racism that informs the immigration and overlapping criminal um, policies in the UK. And um, there I anticipate based on um, the incidences related to deportation of the Windrush generation because I've had scholars from the UK reaching out to me to partner on grants that there will also be additional work in this area. Another area which is one that I have an interest in is the impact of climate change on Caribbean populations. So in 2017, and I believe also in 2019, with the impact on the Bahamas, we had a number of persons being displaced from their communities. And some of that displacement was internal, although others were forcibly displaced and had to leave their country. So in Dominica, for example, in 2017, persons ended up going to Barbados, for example. And as we have more experience with climate change, so heightened hurricanes and other type of meteorological phenomena, flooding, etc., we expect that we will have more experiences like this. And there is work being undertaken with the International Organization for Migration looking precisely at this area that actually drafted a call for action, if you will, on how Caribbean states will respond to this phenomenon. And then lastly, um, there's work currently on the, on the way with respect to Venezuelan migration to the Southern Caribbean. So that's research that I am very involved in. And there are other researchers based in the Caribbean, but also overseas looking at this area. There's a lot to be done in this area, and I've only highlighted three of the, the topical issues at the moment. Specifically within the context of the Caribbean, the governance framework which exists is largely facilitative of migration meaning that it was created to enable migration. It's to foster freedom of movement, and that freedom of movement is to encourage the development, social and economic, of the states which are members of the Caribbean community for CARICOM and the Organization for Eastern Caribbean States. We actually have a framework, or frameworks, because it's, it's two, that um, facilitate mobility within the, within, the, um, within the Caribbean. However, um, um, there is within CARICOM, because the OACS allows um, open movement for all its citizens, in CARICOM it's not as flexible, and we know of the instances such as the Shanit Mary case, where persons are held at the airport and then summarily returned to their home country. And that happens on a 
fairly regular basis. Jamaica does this as well, so it's not the, the typical ones such as Trinidad and Barbados, which appear frequently in the news. Um, so we do know that the immigration officers are not necessarily abiding by the governance framework that is outlined within the, the treaties that establish these mobility frameworks, and that is what causes this this disjoint. The governments make the rules at um, heads of government meetings, and these policies have to be distilled at the national level, and that's where you have the distortion when um, local immigration officers may not understand or misinterpret or deliberately um, thwart what is intended in the, the treaties. So we need to do some work on that and CARICOM has acknowledged that this is an issue on repeated occasions. But the good news is that in 2019, they committed, these are the regional governments, to having full freedom of movement in the near future. This is for governments that wish to do so. So I'm watching to see what happens with respect to, to full freedom of movement within the context of CARICOM. So in terms of how migrants respond, it's hard to say definitively whether it would deter um, because you'd have to um, drill down into what motivated them to move and it's not usually, or deter them and it's not usually one thing. Um, I know that people move irrespective of the fact that there is xenophobia and racism and they try to make the best of the life that they find when they get to their respective destinations. Um, there, there was a lot of scholarship in the past, as I mentioned, on this issue, especially in the, in the UK, um, of persons trying to integrate and the life that they found um, once they arrived. What we have seen is migrants choosing less popular destinations, and it may or may not be because of um, anticipation related to racism. But we have seen, certainly for Jamaicans, persons moving to non-traditional destinations like China um, and experiencing these same challenges with um, racism and xenophobia. I uh, don't know if you saw reported on the news when the COVID epidemic had just um, taken off in January in China, they were actually barring persons of African descent, so that includes Jamaicans, from entering business establishments because they were saying that they were the ones spreading COVID-19, right? right? So these are very real, real issues. And as I mentioned before, a lot of research to do um, in terms of Caribbean migration. Um, but with time, we need time to see for these specific issues, what the implications are. The, the scholarship that I align myself with is the one that the side that views this deportation as a breach of persons' human rights. Um, I do not agree that if somebody commits a criminal offense after having lived overseas for 20 plus years, even a decade, um, that they should be deported. Um, or voluntarily returned, as um, some people refer to it as. Um, I think that there are pathways in that society, especially for the ones who have families in, as in their own family. They will yeah. have children, um, that there should be alternative pathways rather than um, deportation. But, um, the reason that this is done, well, one of the reasons anyways, is to keep down the cost. This is certainly for the UK, to keep down the cost of the prison population for the state. 
So there's a cost attached, yes, <laughs> a cost attached to keeping somebody in prison for a period of time. And it's really um, an economic decision for them to deport. This is one of the challenges I've been encountering in my research because I want to complement my um, examination of the way that the state responds to the migrants with migrant stories of their experiences of that response. And because I work with a vulnerable group, which is undocumented migrants, um, it is difficult to gain access because individuals are usually afraid to share their stories because they don't want that sharing that results in their detention. So exposure to, to detention. And so the challenge with doing that kind of research is you have to ensure that you guard the, the confidentiality of the persons who share their stories and ensure as well that you are not exposing them to greater risk when you do an interview with them. The ethical issues relate primarily around that, the protection of identity and also um, doing no further harm mm -hmm. to the, the migrants. Mm -hmm. And as a, so as a PhD student, I had to go through a rigorous ethical review process because the migrants that I was that I intended to interview are deemed to be vulnerable. And when you do so, you have to examine in your mind, is my study worth this potential pain, for example, in terms of reliving a, a harrowing experience? Mm -hmm. Or um, how will I ensure that um, when I go to this place to meet this migrant, I'm not drawing attention. So I'll just give you an example. Um, when I did research in Barbados, I had to use snowball sampling to get access to migrants because initially persons didn't want to be interviewed. And I was asked a lot of questions about, you know, who I was and what I intended to do with the research before persons volunteered. And they always ask that, you know, I meet in a particular place and um, not necessarily one place, but just a place that was safe for them to do an interview. And it wasn't until um, other migrants vouched for me that I was able to get this access because a lot of them, because they were undocumented, as I said, were in fear of the state and they were driving around with vans picking people up all the time. So whether me meeting with them would potentially expose them to that.